hello. Hello? Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? What number is this? What number are you trying to reach? I don't know. Well, I think you have the wrong number. Do I? It happens. Take it easy. I hate scary movies. I should be studying. You know I got a bio. Baby, did I mention that these tickets are free? <laughs> I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and my and I was three months behind on my rent. So um, I came up with this idea for a scary movie, which later became Scream, and I went off um, to the desert for three days and locked myself in a room, and I pounded it out. And uh, came back, gave it to my agent, he threw it out on the market, and by the end of the day, there was four or five people bidding on it. Everyone else had called and said, we like it, we're going to buy it, but we hadn't heard from Miramax yet. One person from Miramax had called and said, we read the script, but we've got to give it to Bob and Harvey. They haven't read it yet. The next morning, it was like 9 o'clock in the morning, we got a call from Miramax say, you know, it saying, okay, Bob read it, he loved it, he wants to buy it, how much? The first time I had Scary Movie, which was the title of the script at that time, come across my desk, uh, Lisa Harrison, who was at that my time, uh, at that time I... Director of Development uh, slipped it to me on a Friday and said, you have to read this over the weekend because it's going to be a big bidding war next week and maybe we can get somebody to buy it for us. And uh, at that time, we didn't have a deal with Miramax or Dimension or anything. And I read it and I thought, wow, this is really powerful. Um, but uh, came Monday morning, it had already been bought. There was a bidding war over the weekend that we didn't even know about. So uh, Dimension, Miramax owned it. Bob understood it. Bob loved the genre. I mean, Halloween was one of his favorite movies. It was one of my favorite movies. We bonded instantly. We both looked at each other and said, well, who should direct it? And the next thing you know, Wes came on board, and it was just magic from the get-go. And the opening 15 minutes of Scary Movie was so hard, I almost didn't want to go there again. Um, and then I sort of kicked myself in the pants and said, you know, you have a lot of fans that have been telling you you should go back and do a real kick-ass movie again. And I said, if ever there was a kick-ass movie, it's, it's a scary movie. So I call up Bob and I said, OK, I'm going to do it. The first 30 pages were perhaps the most compelling 30 pages of a script I've ever read. I couldn't put it down. I was terrified, which was fun to be terrified during a read. And, and as I, it always is with me in scripts, it's, I instantly start thinking about what it's like with an actor and what that's going to feel like in a movie, and I just said, I have to make this film. Uh, hello? Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I don't think so. When we got the call from Drew, I mean, Drew to her, Drew read this and wanted to be in the movie. And, um, you know, we, we, we were like blessed. We're like Drew, who grew up kind of in some of her early films in this type of genre. We're like, wow, how perfect is that? This is something I've always dreamed to do, you know? But I had no idea how challenging it was going to be until I got involved with the project. It made it a whole different kind of picture right there. Drew Barrymore opening up a horror film and then dying, you know, in 10 minutes. Uh, that was unprecedented. The alternate ending to the movie. <laughs> she lives. She away. It was a calculated risk, and uh, we didn't know whether the audience would even forgive us for that. Um, they did, thankfully. But uh, yeah, it was it was a very risky film in many many ways. Ah! The casting was really fun. For, for one thing, uh, 
the original budget really did not afford uh, the kind of people that we eventually got. And the reason was because with Drew Barrymore aboard and uh, perhaps something to do with my directing it also and the script, then that drew other people. So uh, it sort of had a snowball effect as one really brilliant young actor after another committed to it, then others would say, oh, you mean she's in it, he's in it. And uh, they read the script and they said, my God, this is incredible, I want to be in it too. We ended up with just uh, the absolutely best cast that I've ever had a chance to direct and I think one of the best casts in this kind of movie ever. You know, if I was wrong about Caught and Weary, then the killer's still out there. But don't go there, Sam. You're starting to sound like some Wes Carpenter flick or something. And I think Scream actually was one of the first movies again to kind of capitalize on the television world and kind of find young actresses and actors that hadn't really kind of broken through into the feature world. When I came on board, we already knew Drew Barrymore is going to be in this movie. And that was the only person that had already been set. So when Drew came on, ultimately within three or four weeks, she decided that the role that she wanted was of Casey Becker. And then we had to start our search for Sydney Prescott. Mark. Ready and action. Ring. Ring. Practice ran late. I'm on my way. It's, it's, it's past seven. Don't worry. Casey and Steve didn't bite it till way after ten. I'm not worried. Good, because I want to swing by Blockbuster and get us a video. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. Whatever. Just hurry, okay? Bye. I had actually just done the craft the year before and then was doing Party of Five and it was my second hiatus and wasn't necessarily sure whether I wanted to do another scary type of movie. Um, so I wasn't very certain about the choice, um, but I knew that I wanted to work with Wes. And I went in an audition for him, and he gave great direction. So that was, it was actually a fun process. I like auditioning. It was a hard search because the, you had to have the actress who was vulnerable as well as being really strong. And that's a tough dichotomy to find in um, an actress. Nev Campbell, I'd seen her work on uh, Party of Five. And uh, when I first met her, I said, oh, gosh, she looks so sort of soft and kid next door. I wonder if she has any idea what she's in for, you know, with this uh, incredibly demanding role. I actually said to her, I said, no, this is going to be like uh, boot camp. It's going to be like going into the Marines. Are you ready? She said, I'm ready. I thought, well, maybe she is, maybe she isn't. But uh, Nev turned out to be incredibly resourceful, both as an actress and just as a physical human being. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, running, jumping, climbing, falling, um, fight scenes, an incredible amount of scenes of very, very high emotion, terror and grief and everything else, and just does a terrific job. And you begin to realize this woman is an, a real powerhouse. I mean, she's really an actress to be reckoned with. So, how's the book? Well, it'll be out later this year. Oh, I'll look for it. I'll send you a copy. Oh. I, I think for the role of, of Gail Weathers, that was the one that we were really focusing on, that we definitely wanted to have a recognizable actress. Hi, Gail Weathers is reporting live from Woodsworth Police Station. Hey, we're we're a glimpse of Sydney Prescott. Hey, watch her, Larry. Hey, watch the hand. Mm -hmm. You know no who you're dealing funny. with here? I wanted to play the part of Gail Weathers because she was just a total bitch, and it was something that I hadn't got to play um, in a while, at least being on Friends for so long. And I had to really do some persuading to get the part because most people think of me as the studious type or I play a doctor, but they didn't really see me as a bitch. So I had to try really hard to get this part. You look awfully young to be a police officer. I'm 25 years old. You know, in a demographic study, I proved to be most popular amongst males 11 to 24. I guess I just missed you. <laughs> I had a meeting for the role of Billy. And when I came in, I said, I don't, I really don't think that's the part I'd like to play. I sort of like, like the role of Dewey. And everyone sort of like stopped and was like, whoa. Because they didn't really sort of picture it that way. And, you know, it was written sort of like this big honky guy. <laughs> so I was like, I guess it was a little forward of me, but they sort of went, oh, well. And then I guess Wes sort of liked the idea and it just kind of worked out. It was very uh, heaven sent for me. Dewey's character could have easily been slapstick, but David always brings it back to somebody who is really a true person. To me, it's always been one of the most interesting things to do in the genre is to start with situations that could be cliché or characters that could be cliché and then make it human, because it always catches everybody off guard and, and makes it much more powerful. The, you uh, media type, y'all come in here thinking you're badasses. All righty, here we go. So here's a small town. Very good, here we go. Yeah, Bye. Watch your P's and Q's. 
I will never forget the audition that Skeet gave. And he was, I was sitting here, I was reading the Sydney role when they're in the bedroom. Um, and he was, you know, about two feet, three feet away from me and he was reading it and it was just like, wow, God, you're just the most amazing actor. I started thinking about us and how two years ago, you know, we were kind of hot and heavy and we were definitely an R rating on our way to an NC-17 and then Something changed. Lately, we're just sort of edited for television. Oh. So, you thought you would climb my window and we'd have a little raw footage? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't dream of breaking your underwear rule. Jamie Kennedy was another one of those actors who came into my office. He didn't have that much experience. I think he just finished working on Romeo and Juliet. He came into my office and it was so clear that he was perfect for the role of Randy. So he came in the next day for the producer and director and uh, they fell in love with him. We were absolutely crazy about Jamie Kennedy. He, he was so clearly this role of Randy and that nobody really could have, have done it better. Don't you know the rules? What rules? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a harm. For instance, one. You can never have sex. <laughs> Big no no! Big no no! Oh, dead man. Keep him in oh sex equals yes. death, okay? Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. <laughs> no. The sin factor, it's an extension of number one. And three, never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, say, uh, I'll be right back. Hey, you want another beer? Yeah. I'll be right back. There he goes, folks, a dead man. Wait, bye-bye. Bye, dead boy. Bye. He's dead. What do you have back? We had so much fun on Scream 1. We wouldn't have ever guessed it was going to make $100 million and start everything, you know? Start people's careers, launch people's careers. The first test screening we had, and the only test screening we had, the test scores went through the roof. I just had the feeling, filming certain scenes, that this was extraordinary stuff, you know? Right before Christmas, Variety had done a story that predicted we would be DOA. I remember reading that and going, they've got balls, we're dead on arrival. We're not even getting, like, you know, possibly may make, you know, we were DOA. And then this strange thing started happening. Our weekday numbers just kept growing, and, and Wes and Marianne and I would call each other, we're like, Oh my God, it's like something's happening and it just kept going and going and going and it was, it was a great feeling. Scream 1 was really special. I think the timing was so right, you know, and that's what I was banking on when I wrote the script and that's why I wrote it so quickly because I thought someone else was going to come along and make a scary movie or make a teenage movie and I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to have missed my chance. I saw an opportunity to really sort of take a stab I, and I wrote the movie really quickly so that I could get it out there as quickly as possible and, um, and it paid off. I think it was so successful because first of all, it was a, it was a great horror film. It was scary. It was a scary movie in its simplest of terms but also it's the type of film that invites its audience to come back more and more and notice different things every time. In Scream, they talked about uh, Halloween. They talked about, you know, real films that they had seen and kind of the rules that they had drawn up around those films. I want to see Jamie Lee's breast. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breast? Breast? Not until Trading Places in 83. Jamie Lee was always the virgin in horror movies. She never showed her tits until she went legit. That third wall was broken, and the audience was drawn into a film that was real people talking about real films. And that, I think that awareness that they were in situations that were similar to films that they'd seen opened that whole door to the way that media, films, and television have influenced uh, the last several generations of kids. I thought that it really had a sense of humor, uh, and it was the first movie that, I, that, that I'd ever read in that genre that that was sort of really willing to poke fun at itself in a very intelligent way. It came at a time where people's humor was getting a little, a little sharper in a sense, a little more cynical or sarcastic. You make me so sick. Your entire havoc-inducing, thieving, whoring generation disgusts me. It's the first, like, quote, horror movie that I've ever read that, or seen that really kind of stuck to the characters instead of the blood and gut factor. Characters are really well drawn. It's brought back a horror genre that Halloween started, I think, that we haven't seen in a while. And there's a lot of violence in the first screen, but I can't justify it. It's very violent, but uh, it's f fun. Fun, fun, fun. I think 
a lot of their success is due to the fact that they are such fun, dark roller coasters. The second and third one especially are, are very much just designed to be to be a roller coaster ride, to take you on a, on a journey that goes up and down and, and to throw things at you that you don't expect. It's not the monster under your bed, it's the kid next door. Sydney, come on, you know me. Come on, come on. Sydney, look at me. Give me trouble. Come on. <laughs> For Wes, I think, since he, you know, worked in the genre many times before, he wasn't really interested in repeating himself. He wasn't interested in, you know, doing an homage to himself. He was more interested in doing something new, um, and I think maybe somewhat visually, but I think more with the characters, realization that audiences are much smarter now. I really wrote the script for the read because I wanted to sell it. I wanted people in Hollywood to go, oh, this is some cool dialogue. There's some cool characters. These are some cool plot twists. And I hadn't really written it for the, you know, we had to turn it into a shooting script. We had to take the action scenes that were written where I would just put, you know, girl runs through woods and really turn it into a scary sequence. And that was where, you know, the mastery of Wes Craven comes into play because he knows exactly how to do all that stuff. When Wes came to us, he, you know, this wasn't a monster movie and it didn't have a ton of effects in it. Um, but what we were doing was kind of vital to the movie. You know, we had a few uh, the old-fashioned gore gags with the collapsible knives and uh, blood tubing rigs and stuff like on Drew at the beginning of the movie when she's being pursued. One of the effects we did was the scene where Drew Barrymore gets killed. And she came in and we life cast her and then we made the dummy and, you know, Bob took it out there to shoot with it and, and dressed it up all bloody. And we went through a lot of blood on that show, actually. Oh, what we do for... Oh, for fun. we just get that in my hair? No. Okay, good. Wes and I spent so much time together preparing for this film. I needed to build a real trust with him in order to do a performance like this. One of the things I said to him was, I need the voice. Because we knew that the voice for the film would be really scary, but I said, I need that, I need that person. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. Well, Roger, the voice on the telephone, you just had a voice of intelligence and malevolence, and he could really get into it. And we brought him onto the set when Drew was not there, and we hid him in a part of the house where she never saw him. And she never, I don't think she ever met him. So his voice was a complete mystery and totally in that character for her. Listen, asshole! No, you listen, you little bitch. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? Films are only scary if you feel like you could be in those situations if you can relate to those characters. And if it's too stylized, I think it pulls you out. The first one was shot in Northern California. You know, there's a lot of trees and green, and, you know, it's a very beautiful setting. The, the style kind of builds on that. Because there were so specific things in the script, you know, the, the glass from the first house, or the vulnerability of the outside, the garage door, and the attic that Nev has to run through, and then jump out the window, and then onto the driveway to see the... I mean, all of that's in the script, and we find houses that we could do all of that and shoot in without major building, which was remarkable. It's kind of like an eerie house. Actually, two people have died in this house. Literally, two people have died in the house. So coming up the hill and you're doing a Wes Craven film, and somebody tells you, oh, by the way, two people have died in the house, it brings an entirely new thing. It's kind of a tragic house in that the owners passed away when they were building it. They never really finished the house because they died so suddenly. It sits there on the top of the hill. It's just like a haunted house, and it's kind of designed that in a few years, if they don't paint it, it'll look like a haunted house. I believe it was eight or nine screenings that we had to go back uh, to the MPA in order, in order to get an R rating. They were very much on us for, uh, for the death of uh, Casey's boyfriend at the beginning, for the death of Casey herself, especially when she's hanging from the tree. And then again, the, the whole en ending in general, they had huge problems with the, the Billy and Stu stabbing each other. Ready? Yeah. Yeah! I'm ready, baby! Hey, Get up! Get up, man! Get up! Hey! I had the feeling, in fact, I turned to the crew at one point and said, this will never get onto the screen, but if it does, it's going to make a bajillion dollars because it was so different and so shocking. That last scene, actually, it was so bloody. It was so bloody watching them all stand there for days on end with drench. They'd come out with the little squirt guns and just squirt them all down in blood. And I just went, Wes, it's kind of a bloody movie. 
I said, why is there so, you know, I said, the blood's kind of disturbing me a little bit. I'm kind of queasy. I don't like seeing all this blood. And he just handed me the script and said, okay, well, the writer really wrote this scene about two guys who cut each other up in a kitchen, nearly killing themselves. And um, maybe you could tell me how to do it without blood. And, and I just kind of went, okay, all right, back to the trailer. Get out of there. The writer's not wanted anymore. I know during the opening scene, the, the studio had seen dailies and were a little bit worried you know, about how it was going to work because Wes had done it at essentially a lot of steady cam shots. So when you see it, it may have seemed like it wasn't going to work as well as, as it did. Um, and just based on that, the five days of dailies, we cut it together and uh, sent it off to Wes with no other feedback other than this is the footage. And Wes uh, changed this one music cue and then we fired it off to the studio and they loved it. <laughs> Even while we were shooting the first one, Kevin was talking about he had an idea for the second and that he had actually conceived of it as a trilogy. First attraction to this was just a really terrific first script, but uh, the fact that he had the idea for two more and that it all formed a sort of interconnected story was really fascinating to me. First movie sort of said, don't blame the movies. Well, part two basically is saying, well, then who do you blame? Who do you blame? And if you notice, the killer turned out to be the mother. So Billy Loomis's mother. So you know, it's so, some, some sort of weird sort of underlying way I was saying, come on people, you wanna blame someone, blame the home. It all starts in the home. It all starts with mom and dad. Mrs. Loomis? What? Billy's mother! Smartest twist, huh? Didn't see it coming, did you? In terms of the sequel, I think we all knew what we were getting ourselves into because it, it, you know, the idea was to take the roller coaster to the next step as, as best we could and, and to give a more elaborate ride. Number one, the body count is always bigger. Number two, the death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. Carnage candy. I think there was a big fear that we were going to curtail the, you know, fright factor because of just society, you know, as it is now. But I think that this is the kind of movie it is. And I don't think you can shortchange your, your audience. Probably, from my mind, the most effective scene in Scream 2 is the opening, uh, especially when we previewed it. And people originally, all through that scene, they're, they're very into it, you know, the, all you see all the ghosts running around. And, and it's this it's very kind of macabre setting and, and kind of the way it's commenting on itself. And at the end of it, when she is up on stage and, and then dies and it collapses into complete silence, there's a whole silence in the theater because nobody knows how to take that. What are you saying about the very audience who's sitting in this room watching it, in this film within a film within a film? Big screen! You know, it was just a lot of fun to make. Um, and so I said, well, with this cast and, you know, the whole concept, it should be really fun. Of course, I get to work with the master, which is Wes Craven. It doesn't get any better than that. If you're gonna do horror, do it right. Let's go one more time. Nick, let's back in the background with the big uh, stabs. I was excited. I was just like, let's do it, you know? And, and, and especially once I found out, you know, Jordan and I were gonna be in it together. So I was like, let's go have fun, you know? <laughs> Sorry, I had to, baby. I actually signed on before I got to read the script. That's how confident I was that I wanted to be a part of this. I enjoyed the first one so much and just had thought such wonderful things about it. And I love the horror genre and I love the comedy and I love Kevin's writing. And I was really would love to work with Wes that I signed on without reading it, which is something I've never done. I was a fan of horror movies as a kid. It was the thing to do, to go to someone's house and scare yourself to death. And of course, after the horror movie, you tell the worst possible stories. So I am just so delighted to work with Wes because it's like, it really is like a horrific nightmare come true. I read for about three characters. <laughs> I read for every character in the movie. I read for Cece, I read for Hallie, and I read for Maureen. So it was interesting to be offered this role because it's, it's nothing like the other characters that I auditioned for, but I guess Wes, you know, could sort of see something that would coincide with this character. I think that she's... Shy. She's just really shy. And cut. It's one of my favorite genres, so uh, getting to do one is sort of almost like a dream come true. Well, I think I love you. Isn't that what life is made of? And though it worries me to say I've never felt this way. Hey, I think I love you, so what am I so afraid of? 
the thing I remember the most in Scream 2, the effect I think uh, that is there the most in the film is the, uh, the pull through the head of the, um, Chris Doyle. Yeah, swerving the car around and they wreck into like a construction site and this steel pipe goes through the back of the guy's head who's on top of the car. And so it was supposed it. to go, I think, through his shoulder, yeah. and it ended up going right through, through, his through head, the center right of his head. Right through the center of the head, and Wes like, oh, that's, right. that's cool. <laughs> so we got a call like, oh, we might have to remake the dummy, and I was like, ah. Uh. And then Wes called, like, oh, no, no, it went through the head, it was great. It was interesting, the MPAA on that film, we, we jacked up the film when we submitted to them. We went, Omar Epps gets stabbed in the ear, we cut him getting stabbed in the ear three times. And Randy's death, we played out so long and bloody and violent that he just got stabbed forever. Because we're thinking, okay, they're gonna cream us so then we can peel back to what we want. And they gave us an R, first time out. Because they felt the, the message of the film was, was much more significant and that they were, was much more in tune with what they liked in terms of how that opening comment that set them up for the whole rest of the movie. When I was first hired for the job, I didn't know at the end of each movie if I was gonna make it. All the characters I created around the main character of Sydney, I knew were, you know, fair game. They could, you know, they, they were, either they're the killer or they're a victim, one or the other. You know, conversations with Wes and myself, and then I think conversations with the producers and everything was, you know, shoot the shot of, do we get him put in the ambulance? He's a great character. Who knows, maybe you want it. Maybe, and you know, we don't have to cut it in. If we want him to die, you know, we, we can have him die, but we might want it. Of course, the second we got it, we cut it in and never cut it out. Yeah, do we? Watch your back. Go. <sighs> I can't believe you're alive. Are you okay? Yeah. You hang in there. He was lucky. Knife went into some old scar tissue. Saved his life. I'm coming with you. It was always planned to be a trilogy. I think the surprise for everybody was that they would happen so quick next to one another. In Scream 3, there was, uh, not only was it an effort to try and keep them interesting, but there's also a, was a concern, um, given the kind of political climate about the violence in the cinema, that, you know, we, how violent can we be? Stone's death, I know, is one thing that we went back and shot some more stuff on, because uh, we killed him the first time, and we decided he went too easy. <laughs> So we went back and bashed him up some more. In terms of the ending, which we went back and they shot for uh, four days on, Wes concocted the whole thing of, of Roman getting the upper hand, because orig originally she hit him with the chair. The trick was it was important to believe that, yes, she was going to lose. And so that, that became a really important thing, because never, that was the key thing we discussed that was different than the other two, because never in the other two do you ever really feel she's going to lose. But it's important in this one that you think, finally, yes, this is it. Do we do something? Just stand back. Do we? Scary movies have always thrilled me. I always wanted to be in one, actually. When I was younger, this is so retarded, but I'm telling it anyway. I used to dream of being the movie star. I used to practice walking down a hallway and scared, like, who's there? So it was kind of perfect and ironic that I got to be in this. <laughs> I was like, this is so surreal. I can't believe I'm in a Wes Craven movie. Here's how I see it. I've got no house, no bodyguard, no movie, and I'm being stalked. Because someone wants to kill me? No, because someone wants to kill you. So now, starting now, I go where you go. That way, if someone wants to kill me, I'll be with you. And since they really want to kill you, they won't kill me. They'll kill you. Make sense? None. Very, very interesting progressions. Many of the familiar faces from the other screams are in the Scream 3 to find their final resolution in a very, very interesting way that you couldn't have had if it was just, uh, you know, another sequel with all new characters and just the same killer. Wes is so great. Everyone loves working for him. The one thing about our, our movies, I will brag, is that everyone has such a great time and they just say how much more fun they have on our movies than anyone else's. Let's not give away the magic, ladies. A lot of people think, oh, Wes Craven, you know, he makes all these horror films, he's gotta be really sick and really twisted, and they always ask me that, and he's actually not. He's very zen in a lot of ways. He's a very calm spirit. He keeps a very cool atmosphere on set, and he's very warm and deep in a lot of ways. Working with Wes Craven is a dream. I feel like at this point he's like my father. I don't feel like there's anything I can't say or do in front of him or be. I don't think there's any line they can't cross. Are you taping this? This is, Wes doesn't like to be taped after two o'clock. Javari has to have his tea. Cut the, ah!
utilizes what we all do well and allows us to bring it in as opposed to like saying no, no, no. He's more of a yes and person. Yes and do this, yes and do this. I thought that maybe he was gonna be a little quirky, a little wild, a little crazy, and you know, maybe a little offbeat. <laughs> I'd be a little afraid of him, <laughs> you know, more so than the script. <laughs> but he is so calm and he is so wonderful and he's great. I went to NYU Film and uh, I took a class called the horror genre and half of the class is dedicated to Wes. And I actually have two papers that I wrote on two separate Wes Craven films, The First Nightmare on Elm Street and, and one of his earlier ones. I was thinking about bringing him in so he could sign him, but I don't know, I think that might be kind of pushing it. It's so nice working with such a great director because Wes really, really knows how to do it. And some of the cute anecdotes that he used to do before he said action was, um, I was going into this office and he would say, Ooh, what's that noise? It's scary. Action. Well, how do you not laugh? You know, he's trying to like make the little build up, but I think he's just a little doll and I'm so glad I got to work with him. I hold him responsible a lot for, for David and I getting together. I think that he was really instrumental in that as far as just like being an overseer and saying, look guys, this is what you have. I see you guys together. And I just think he was really, he was, he's just kind of a, I don't want to see a father figure because he's not old enough to be a father figure. Well, actually, I think he is. <laughs> this is a case where a film was um, really just a great place to shoot, and at the same time, it's turned out terrifically well. Diet Coke and hard nipples, that's what it's all about. <sighs> and blood in a minute. Did that fuck you up if I lean in a little bit? I'll let you fall off and break your silly neck. Hey, it's Lisa here with more on horror. The Exorcist was the first horror film to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. Now, the horror genre has never gotten much love from the Academy, though there still seems to be a bias against scary movies during awards season. The Exorcist earned 10 Oscar nominations in 1974, including Best Supporting Actress nod for Linda Blair, who was just 15 years old at the time. Now, do you like my shirt? You can get one in the description below.